The Romans had long heard rumors of what lay to its distant north. Over the years, several commanders had tentatively ventured further and further into the lands of Britannia. However, it would be the general Gnaeus Julius Agricola who in 78 AD sought to push Roman frontiers to their furthest reach yet. Composed of 20,000 men, the first phase of this expedition saw him bring to heel many rebellious tribes. Resistance culminated in an ambush on the 9th Legion, which very nearly wiped out his forces. However, Agricola managed to save his men, breaking the enemy and paving the way for his continued advance. In the next phase of the invasion, the general would push to the very ends of the island where he would fight the climactic battle of Mons Grapius, the last stand of the ancient Scots. Browsing the internet with an unencrypted connection is the equivalent of having a home with transparent walls and no windows. Uh, the difference is that in the digital space, your neighborhood is the entire world and your neighbors are filled with bots and systems meant to scrape every bit of your personal life for profit. And this type of modern problem needs a modern solution. This is where virtual private networks come in. They hide your IP address and safeguard your internet connection through an encrypted tone. This way, your private information is kept safe from prying eyes. Now, I know there's a lot of VPN providers out there, and I myself can get quite confused with them, but today's sponsor, Private Internet Access, should be at the top of your list. With over 30 million downloads and an excellent rating on Trustpilot, they've already proven to the market that they know what they're doing. First, it's super easy to use across all platforms with an unlimited number of devices protected under your subscription. Second, not only does it work with all the major streaming services anywhere in the world, meaning you can remove Netflix geo restrictions easily, but it's also one of the few VPNs that can support peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Third, they've got an audited, court-backed, no-logs policy which guarantees they never record or store any of your user data. And finally, they've got a 24-7 customer support line and a 30-day money-back guarantee. So try private internet access today by clicking the link in the description below. They're offering 83% off, so that's just two bucks and three cents a month, plus four extra months free. So definitely check it out. Enjoy. With their confidence soaring after their recent victories, the Romans redoubled their efforts and once more pushed into Caledonia in early 83 AD. Agricola also received the unfortunate news that his son, who had been born just a year before, had died. But he bore this loss with stoic determination and pressed on. He first sent his fleet to raid the Caledonian towns located along the coast, intending to sow terror and confusion ahead of the advance of his main army. However, these raids, as well as their defeats in the previous year, failed to shake the resolve of the Caledonians and their various tribes who now united to oppose the Roman invasion. They were led by a man named Calgacus, of whom we unfortunately know almost nothing. But he must have been a well-respected and influential figure to be able to rapidly bring the Caledonian people together in this manner. Calgacus decided to face Agricola in a pitched battle, and chose as the site of his stand a place known as Mons Grapius. Debate continues regarding what the modern-day location of this battlefield may have been. However, one prominent theory is that Mons Grapius was the name for a range of hills in Scotland near Aberdeenshire. The area provided Calgacus with a natural advantage over Agricola, as he was able to position his army on high ground overlooking the flat plains, which also helped negate the Roman advantage in cavalry. Agricola was undeterred by this, however, and quickly accepted Calgacus's challenge. The Battle of Mons Grapius was about to begin. Agricola's forces consisted of elements of the 2nd Audiatrix, the 2nd Augusta, the 9th Hispania, and the 20th Valeria Victrix legions, supported by 8,000 auxiliary infantry, prime among them being the Batavian and Tungrian cohorts from Germania, in addition to 3,000 auxiliary cavalry, as well as some recently recruited Britain allies. Since we do not know how large the legionary detachments were, we can unfortunately only guess at the total size of the Roman army. However, it is likely that it consisted of around 20,000 men. Agricola deployed his infantry into two lines, the first of which contained all of his auxiliary infantry, while the legions were held in reserve in the second line. The cavalry were divided evenly between the army's flanks. Tacitus claimed that one of Agricola's motives behind placing his auxiliaries in the front line was that he hoped to win the battle without having to resort to risking the lives of his legionaries, 
allowing him to claim he had crushed the Caledonians without shedding a drop of citizen blood. This has in turn contributed to the popular myth that auxiliaries were regarded as much more expendable by the Romans. However, it is clear from the service record of the Roman military, as well as Tacitus' own records, that their commanders did not show any considerable bias in placing either the legions or the auxiliaries at the forefront of the fighting. After all, both troop types were at the forefront of Roman battles in equal measure, and were deployed in whatever manner was deemed most suitable for them by their generals. The legions, however, had a higher level of organization compared to the many individual auxiliary cohorts, and thus functioned better as reserve troops, allowing Roman generals to quickly plug gaps in the line or reinforce hotspots. Furthermore, as Roman citizenship gradually spread or was awarded early to deserving auxiliary soldiers, thus breaking down the old social barrier between the legions and the auxiliaries, it is likely that a significant minority of the Batavians and Tugurians at least would have already been Roman citizens, meaning Roman blood would have been spilled regardless. Thus, while Tacitus himself may have interpreted Agricola's actions as trying to save Roman lives, in truth, this was simply a practical application of the troops the Roman general had available to him. Calgacus's army, meanwhile, consisted of 30,000 warriors who were almost entirely infantrymen, but were still supported by numerous war chariots. Their infantry was arrayed atop the hills, with the intent of intimidating the Romans by making their great numbers as visible as possible to their foes. It would have also been an ideal defensive position for the largely infantry-based Caledonian army, which also helped negate the Roman advantage in cavalry. Meanwhile, the Caledonian chariots were placed in the open plains, likely to harass the Roman lines in skirmishes. Overall, the Caledonian deployment was sensible and played well to the strengths of their army. However, Calgacus still had to be wary of the high quality of Agricola's troops, who enjoyed considerable advantages in terms of organization, equipment, and training and whose morale was high in the wake of recent victories. Before the battle, both commanders gave speeches to their armies to inspire them for the coming bloodshed. It is likely that Tacitus' account of Calgacus' speech was entirely invented, as was indeed normal for many such speeches recorded by ancient historians. However, considering his close connections to Agricola, we can speculate that his account of the Roman general's words was at least relatively accurate. Agricola quickly realized that he was outnumbered by a considerable margin and ordered his first line to be extended in order to prevent his troops from being outflanked, despite the protest of his officers who advised him to deploy the legions for battle. According to Tacitus, Agricola had his horse sent away and took position in the front ranks alongside his men. As with every battle in antiquity, Mons Grapius began with skirmishing between the light troops of both sides, exchanging volleys of javelins. Tacitus reports that the Caledonians displayed considerable skill in dodging the Roman volleys or even swatting their javelins from the air using their swords. Aside from these acrobatic displays, nothing of note developed in these early clashes. Next, the Roman heavy infantry then charged at their Caledonian counterparts, who advanced down from the hills to meet their enemies in the plains. The assault was spearheaded by four cohorts of Batavians and two more of Tungrians, all of whom were battle-hardened veterans. Tacitus records the bloody results of the clash between the two sides as follows. Quote, These old soldiers had been well drilled in sword fighting, while the enemy were awkward at it, with their small shields and unwieldy swords, especially as the latter, having no points, were quite unsuitable for cut and thrust struggle at close quarters. The Batavians, raining blow after blow, striking them with the bosses of their shields and stabbing them in the face, felled the Britons posted on the plain and pushed on up to the hillsides. This provoked other cohorts to attack with vigor and kill the nearest of the enemy. Many Britons were left behind, half dead or even wounded, owing to the very speed of our victory. While the Roman infantry continued its onslaught, the cavalry on the flanks engaged the enemy chariots. While these were certainly fearsome engines of war, manned by some of the most notable men of the tribes, it seems that their methods of combat were ill-suited for the nature of the Battle of Mons Grapius. Details are lacking but it seems that the Roman auxiliary cavalry were swiftly able to close with the swarm of chariots, routing the Caledonian charioteers upon the first charge, and thus depriving Calgacus of his army's already very limited mobility. Perhaps emboldened by this success, the Roman cavalry then charged into the Caledonian infantry up the hill, an action very rarely undertaken by heavy horse. Nevertheless, the Roman cavalry performed well under the circumstances, and the initial impact of their charge inflicted heavy casualties on the enemy. 
However, after the impetus of the Roman assault began to fade, the tables soon began to turn on Agricola. His infantry only had a tenuous foothold on the hills and continued to face stiff resistance while the Roman cavalry charge had ground to a halt thanks to the difficult terrain and the depth of the enemy's ranks. Furthermore, the routed chariots were still proving to be problematic, as occasionally horses detached from their vehicles and ran amok, or out-of-control chariots would crash into the exposed sides of the Roman formations, causing much havoc. We can only begin to imagine the chaotic nature of such a fight when witnessed amidst the cacophony of yells and clashes at the ground level. For those caught in the melee, this would have meant a near-complete blindness to the overall events of the battle. Perhaps foreseeing this, the Caledonians had actually kept a substantial body of men in reserve at the highest point of the hills. Thus far uncommitted, they now began to march around the flanks of the Romans, threatening to encircle them. However, Agricola had come prepared for this as well, and once the Caledonians had advanced suitably far, he sprung his trap. Reserve units of auxiliary cavalry were sent into battle, and managed to catch the Caledonians completely by surprise. This unexpected assault threw the Caledonians who had begun preparing to outflank the Romans into a rout and exposed their comrades still engaged with Agricola's main force to a second Roman cavalry charge into their exposed rear. Discipline among the Caledonians now broke down, and they began to flee towards the hills and forests around the battlefield, suffering heavy casualties as they went. However, the Caledonians were not entirely beaten just yet, and they actually began to regroup in the relative safety of the woodland. Here they succeeded in surprising the lead units of Roman infantry that had eagerly pursued them and clearly expected to only find defeated and demoralized barbarians. For a time, this led to a desperate struggle within the forests. However, Agricola's quick thinking prevented his pursuit from spiraling out of control. He ordered his lightly equipped auxiliary foot, supported by dismounted cavalry, to clear the Caledonians out of the forests while his heavy troops began to reform. As some of the Caledonians fled into more open areas, the still-mounted cavalry were able to effectively pursue them. When the Caledonians finally saw that the Romans had recovered from their ambush, they lost all hope of victory and retreated. The Battle of Mons Grapius was over. This victory would mark the height of Agricola's campaigns. According to Tacitus, the Caledonians lost over 10,000 men, while Roman losses were just 360 among them a prefect of an auxiliary cohort named Aulus Atticus. At first glance, it may be tempting to simply dismiss these one-sided casualty figures as an exaggeration by Tacitus meant to elevate his father-in-law's glory. However, we should bear in mind that ancient warfare was normally a relatively tentative affair and not the wild, bloody melee popularized by Hollywood. As a result, casualties typically only became serious when one side lost its nerve and fled, allowing their enemy to massacre their disordered ranks more easily. In this context, it is thus actually quite likely that the numbers given by Tacitus are at least fairly close to the truth. The Romans spent the following night celebrating their victory, while on the Caledonian side, panic quickly spread as news of their crushing defeat reached more people. Entire settlements were rapidly abandoned and the tribes began to flee to the highlands, hoping to evade the Romans in the unfamiliar and difficult terrain. On the following morning, Roman scouts were met with an eerie silence wherever they went discovering that much of the territory in their path had been thoroughly abandoned. Agricola, however, appears to have been undisturbed by this and marched ever deeper into Caledonia, spending the winter in the lands of a tribe known as the Boresti. It was also around this time that another notable milestone was achieved by the Romans, the entire circumnavigation of Britain. Even though the Romans had been in Britain for decades now, there remained much uncertainty over Britain's geography, including whether it was truly an island. Agricola's campaigns were thus also notable for the extensive efforts made to map out the remainder of Britain, and his governorship was subsequently famed for this achievement. Agricola sent his fleet and a detachment from his field army on this expedition, who likely departed from the Moray coast and appear to have first sailed up to the Shetland Islands before turning south to begin the circumnavigation proper. During the voyage, the Romans encountered many new peoples previously unknown to them, but unfortunately, we know little else about this important expedition. After exploring the north, the fleet would have turned west and then sailed back towards its base at modern-day Richborough, where it may have ended its journey of perhaps one month in length. After all, the Romans already knew the coastline well, and thus may have considered it already covered and not worth sailing back up as they had done recently with Agricola. Regardless of where it precisely ended, 
This expedition was significant, and the fact that it was done during Agricola's term as governor, by his orders, boosted his fame considerably. In 84 AD, Agricola continued his efforts to further consolidate his gains in Caledonia, building additional forts to garrison these lands. The most notable among them was the legendary fortress at modern-day Inchtudo, the remains of which are still visible today. However, while he was in the middle of these operations, Agricola received a new set of orders from the Emperor Domitian. The general was recalled to Rome immediately, ending his unusually long tenure as governor. Meanwhile, the Romans continued to garrison the parts of Caledonia that Agricola had conquered, but ultimately these gains were never consolidated and were abandoned by 90 AD. But why would Rome so quickly abandon these hard-won gains? After all, the Caledonians had been crushed in battle and were no longer a military threat, so in theory this might make holding on to northern Britannia appear easy. Tacitus was indeed convinced that this was a foolish move by Domitian, who only recalled Agricola out of jealousy. However, we should note that Tacitus was never very fond of Domitian in the first place, and this bitterness combined with his admiration of his father-in-law probably led him to have a biased view of the situation. In reality, Domitian's decision to abandon Agricola's conquests in Caledonia was sensible, given the situation the Roman Empire had found itself in at the time. For one, it allowed more troops to be freed up to go fight the resurgent Dacians on the Danube frontier, who were a far more pressing threat to Roman interest, targeting some of the empire's most lucrative provinces. Indeed, this was the fate of many of Agricola's troops, such as the Second Audiotrix Legion. The territory that Agricola had occupied was also not especially valuable, and its population had largely fled to the highlands, where they would need to be rooted out in lengthy mopping up operations, and were likely hostile towards Rome. Controlling such territory so far away from the center of Roman power would have been a considerable political and logistical burden, and so, with their enemies in the region defeated and Roman honor satisfied, Domitian made the pragmatic decision to pull back and redraw the frontier at a more stable location. Regardless, Agricola's achievements in Britannia cemented his reputation as one of Rome's foremost generals of the time, and he was rewarded with triumphal ornaments in recognition of his victory, as well as a public statue. Despite his fame, Agricola would never again command an army, although there reportedly was much demand from the public for him to return to the field to fight in the costly wars along the Danube. Ultimately, however, Gnaeus Julius Agricola would die in 93 AD, not long after the last of his conquests in the far north were left to the Caledonians. As for the region where Agricola had made a name for himself, it would continue to be an active frontier until the end of Roman Britain during the 5th century AD. Several more campaigns were fought against the tribes in the region as they would seek any opportunities to raid the wealthy Roman province to the south. A few emperors did show interest in expanding Roman control back into the north, but otherwise, the region was not considered important enough to invest the time and resources that would be required to fully occupy it. Instead, the Romans preferred to maintain a defensible frontier from which they could monitor and control movement in and out of the province. One could say, that this was a policy literally set in stone when the Emperor Hadrian ordered the construction of a massive wall along the northern frontier. From there, Rome would continue to exert its influence over the tribes in Caledonia through diplomacy and trade while continuing its wars against those who rose to oppose them, until the very end of imperial rule over the Isles. We hope you found this episode both educational and entertaining. A ton of what we do is made possible by our talented artists. They actually run their own store with awesome merch, which I suggest you check out. All proceeds go to them, and it's a great way to ensure that they can keep supporting these sorts of creative endeavors. Consider also supporting the channel by joining our Patreon, where you can catch script previews, participate in polls, and grab HD downloads of all our art. A big thanks to the current patrons for funding the channel, and to the researchers, writers, and artists for making this episode possible. We couldn't have done it without this team and this community. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to like and subscribe for more content, and check out these other related videos. See you in the next one.